All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we are gonna talk about something here called the vomit pathway. And that sounds really gross. I promise this has nothing to do with puking. Uh, but this is a really important pathway, uh, more so convergence of pathways for the USMLE. They love to go after these. There's a few disorders that uh, are really high yield for the exam. Uh, so we're gonna go over this pathway and I'm gonna try to make it as easy as I can and try to uh, keep out the steps that aren't really important and just focus on the steps that really are important. Now the better term for this that biochemists use is called the propionate pathway. And the reason is because propionyl-CoA is kind of the convergence point of these pathways. All right, so let's start out with, uh, well, okay, I, I should bring up here that uh, there are five really important uh, products or intermediates or, uh, or reactants uh, in this pathway and they're uh, they use the acronym VOMIT. That's why it where it gets the name. And so they are valine, odd chain fatty acids, methionine, isoleucine, and threonine. All right, so let's knock out a couple of these. So we have valine and isoleucine. I'm going to use the abbreviations here. Valine and isoleucine will ultimately become propionyl CoA. This is a big, long process. There are several enzymes involved, uh, but the enzyme that's most important is called branch chain ketoacid dehydrogenase, BCKDH. And this is one of our tender, loving care for Nancy enzymes, this, this complex. Uh, and remember, the other ones are pyruvate dehydrogenase and uh, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase in the TCA cycle. These use those five cofactors, but the big important one is thiamine. Thiamine. So we're going to come back to why that's important in a little bit. So valine and isoleucine will become propionyl-CoA. The other one that uses this enzyme, but it's not part of the vomit pathway because it does not converge on propionyl-CoA, is called leucine. And leucine uses the same enzyme, but it will become acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA goes into the TCA cycle, as you're probably aware. Okay, so next, the T is threonine. And threonine uses a variety of enzymes, and it will become something called alpha-ketobutyrate. And then the other is methionine, the M. And this is an important pathway, but we're not going to talk about it here. I'll make this the subject of a different video. Uh, but ultimately, it goes through a process and will become cystathione. And one of the intermediates of this pathway is homocysteine, and that's why it, that's important, because there is disease that you need to know uh, that causes accumulation of homocysteine. Now, the big cofactor for this entire pathway is folate. So that's something you'll want to know for methionine uh, metabolism, folate. Okay, now the next one is odd chain fatty acids. OCFA. And this is a degradation process through, uh, through fatty acid oxidation. And as you may be aware, fatty acids are very long carbon structures. And as they're oxidized, they give off acetyl-CoAs. And acetyl-CoA has two carbons. So let's say that you've got a fatty acid that's got 14 carbons. Well, you're going to make seven acetyl-CoAs. Okay, but what what about what if you had fifteen carbons? It was an odd chain, odd number, odd chain fatty acid. Well, you'll give off two and two and two and two, and then ultimately you're going to end up with three, and you can't really do anything with that. That th that structure with three carbons is propionyl CoA, and so that's why you get propionyl CoA with odd chain fatty acids, but not with even chain fatty acids. Okay, so now we have propionyl-CoA, kind of our convergence point here, and propionyl-CoA will get converted to something called methylmalonyl-CoA. And the enzyme that it uses is called propionyl-CoA carboxylase. 
And I want you to know, and you really need to put this in your head, that any enzyme that says carboxylase uses biotin as a cofactor. Biotin. And biotin is vitamin B7. It's a B vitamin. Next, methylmalonyl-CoA. That gets converted to succinyl-CoA. And succinyl-CoA then goes into the TCA cycle. Now, the enzyme that does this is called methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. It also uses a cofactor. And you know what that cofactor is? It's vitamin B12. And you probably are aware that if you've got a patient with potentially a B12 deficiency, let's say they've got, uh, let's say they've got uh, a... Uh, uh, anemia, um, macrocytic anemia, and you think they may have a B12 deficiency, what are the two things that you measure? You measure homocysteine, which remember uses folate to be metabolized, and then you measure MMA, or methylmalonic acid. And the reason you do that is because if you're missing B12, you can't use methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. And so methylmalonic, uh, methylmalonyl-CoA will build up and it will get converted to methylmalonic acid. And so that's why you've got that elevation with the B12 deficiency. So that is our pathway. Uh, one thing I do want to bring up, though, briefly, is succinyl-CoA can uh, combine with glycine, and that will become something called D-ALA, or delta aminolevulinic acid. And remember that that's part of the heme synthesis pathway. So there are other places where succinyl-CoA can go. Okay, so now there are three diseases that are going to be really important for you to be aware of for the USMLE. The first is branch chain ketoacid dehydrogenase deficiency, which we have a better word for that. It's called maple syrup urine disease. And the reason that it's called that is because when valine, isoleucine, and leucine build up in the blood, they form ketones, and those ketones smell really sweet, just like with diabetic ketoacidosis. Except this is going to build up in the urine, it's going to build up in other bodily secretions, and it causes a sort of burnt sugar smell. Not a fruity smell, but a burnt sugar smell. And that's where it gets the name maple syrup urine disease. Now, a couple other disorders that are more along this common pathway as we go from propionyl-CoA to methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA is propionyl-CoA carboxylase deficiency or propionic acidemia. And then another one is methylmalonyl-CoA mutase deficiency, which causes methylmalonic acidemia. And the name just comes from whatever is building up, which can be propionic, uh, propionyl-CoA or methylmalonyl-CoA. So as you can see, all three of these will result in buildup of products, but it interferes with the ability of these products to get to succinyl-CoA and enter the TCA cycle. And these things will become acids. And so they all will cause a, a, a metabolic acidosis, particularly an anion gap metabolic acidosis. Okay, so let's go into the importance of these three disorders and how they manifest. First of all, you may be asked on the USMLE, what's the inheritance pattern? They may ask you, a mom and a dad gave birth to a baby with maple syrup urine disease. What's the probability of them having another child? For the most part, you can remember any of the metabolic disorders are going to be autosomal recessive uh, with a few exceptions. And in fact, all three of these organic acidemias are autosomal recessive inheritance. Okay, now propionic acidemia and methylmalonic acidemia, they share something in common. If you watched my video on the urea cycle, you will know that propionyl-CoA and methylmalonyl-CoA indirectly interfere with the urea cycle. And so because they interfere with the urea cycle, if you've got a buildup of these products, you're going to have a hard time getting rid of ammonia. And so that's what 
that that's how this manifests. It really manifests as a hyperaminemia. It really masquerades as a urea cycle disorder. So you get all the classic symptoms that you would get as if you had a urea cycle disorder. So you get the hyperaminemia and you get the poor feeding and vomiting and lethargy and seizures and all that. Now you'll also get a tendency to have neutropenia. And the reason is because propionyl-CoA and methylmalonyl-CoA interfere with hematopoiesis. So these babies, and they are babies that show up with these symptoms, they will tend to have an anemia, uh, particularly a neutropenia. Uh, and then another thing that they may show up with is a hypoglycemia, and that's because these products also interfere with gluconeogenesis. Okay, now the labs to distinguish propionic acidemia and methylmalonic acidemia are just going to be the, the products that either build up or don't get formed. And if you know this pathway, in particular, if you just know propionyl-CoA to methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA, PMS, then you'll know exactly what builds up and what it will be deficient. With propionic acidemia, you're going to have a buildup of propionyl-CoA and a deficiency of methylmalonyl-CoA because you can't form it. You'll also have a hyperaminemia and you'll have an anti-angap metabolic acidosis. With methylmalonic acidemia, the deficiency is that you're not able to get from methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA. So you're going to have a buildup of methylmalonyl-CoA, or they may tell you uh, a, a buildup of methylmalonic acid, kind of like if you had a B12 deficiency. So uh, really the labs are just asking you to distinguish where the block is in the metabolic pathway. Now the treatment for these are very similar. You need to restrict everything that's part of the vomit pathway. Because remember, everything converges on propionyl-CoA. So you've got to restrict valine, odd-chain fatty acids, methionine, isoleucine, and threonine. Now the difference is a supplement that we give. So with propionic acidemia, we give a biotin supplement. Why is that? Because propionyl-CoA carboxylase uses biotin as a cofactor. And you might be asking, well, okay, but we don't have that enzyme. Why would we give the cofactor? And the answer is you have a little bit of it. And so you want to maximize its activity. So you give this, uh, this cofactor to try to maximize whatever you got around. So for propionyl propionic acidemia, you give a biotin supplement. With methylmalonic acidemia, you give a vitamin B12 supplement. Now, maple syrup urine disease is kind of different uh, in that you get this buildup of isoleucine, leucine, and valine, which use branched-chain ketoacid dehydrogenase. And if you go back here, you can see that this just uh, interferes with these three. Okay, it doesn't interfere with threonine, it doesn't interfere with methionine, it doesn't interfere with odd chain fatty acids, so you don't need to restrict those in the diet. You just need to restrict valine, isoleucine, and leucine. Now, when valine, isoleucine, and leucine build up in the blood, they form ketones, and those ketones smell sweet, and it causes the urine to have a sweet smell. But on the USMLE, they might not tell you that the urine has a sweet smell. They might tell you that the earwax has a sweet smell, uh, kind of because maple syrup urine disease gives it away in the name. Uh, so they may tell you the earwax has a sweet smell. What you're not going to get, unlike the other two, is a hyperaminemia. Okay. So that makes it a little bit different. So here, you just need to restrict isoleucine, leucine, and valine. And the, the way that you can remember the branched chain amino acids, those three, is I love Vermont maple syrup, I-L-V maple syrup. So I-L and V are in the maple syrup urine disease, isoleucine, leucine, and valine. Sorry, Canadians, but Vermont has superior maple syrup. Okay, so in addition to restricting those three branched chain amino acids, we give a thiamine supplement. And the reason at this point should be pretty straightforward because thiamine is the big cofactor for the branched chain ketoacid dehydrogenase. So you'll give a thiamine supplement for this. And that's it. If you know all this stuff, you are good to go for these three diseases and for this entire pathway.